Welcome back, guys. I'm your host, Eric Turner of The Film Room. Hey, and I'm Greg Thompson, host of the Cover One Buffalo Podcast. Tonight's going to be time to switch gears as we go from season recaps and looking at last year, now into the reviews of the 2021 offseason of free agency. So, yeah, we're going to bring some free agents, maybe that you know, maybe that you don't know, but also some scheme fits, not your big name type, big ticket players, but some guys that maybe are a little under the radar. Yeah, and we also want to know what you guys are looking for. What positions do you think we'll target? What are some names that you're looking for? And we'll talk about whether they're a good fit for the Bills or whether we can afford them. So when we take a look at all the different options that we have here, we think it's going to be a great discussion. Jump aboard. Yo, what's going on, guys? What is up, Greg? Good to see you, brother. Saturday night, man. I have a long weekend. I have a three-day weekend. So I was like, you know what? Let's talk some Bills. Let's have a couple of drinks. Let's, uh, let's talk some football. I like it. I like. It. Yeah, I was. Uh, I wasn't expecting it today. I, I had some time kind of blocked off today to start building up my list of yeah. value free agents. So when you reached out, I was like, "Yeah, this is perfect." Um, it, so it's fun. We'll start out tonight talking a little bit on the defensive side of the ball because there's a couple news items. Obviously, you know, every time you get online, people are going and checking the latest tweet from JJ Watt, checking the the latest on on what's happening for for everything there. It is really fun that the hottest name currently available to sign with anybody is interested in joining the Buffalo Bills. That's kind of new for us to, to have that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, obviously Kimberly Martin talking about there's mutual interest and then I know the other kind of more recent news item, whatever you want to say, was kind of a confirmation of what many of us interpreted Brandon Bean's presser to be, but that it does seem pretty formal that Matt Milano is not going to be reaching any extensions or re-signing before free agency. I, I think some people have read that as he's automatically out the door. I don't know that I go that far, but it does right. look like he is going to fully test free agency. Uh, and that kind of merges pretty well with what we're going to talk about tonight. Yeah, you know, and no one's surprised about that. And Matt Milano was obviously a, a integral piece the last few few years on that defense, especially when you talk in coverage and his disruption skills. So it's kind of sad to see a guy like that, you know, hit the market. But I think it was it was expected, you know, given what he's you know likely to get based on his production. And I think Bean is smart by letting him hit the market because what he's valued at on paper. Once he hits the market, you're going to see that's going to change, especially given this uh, cap off season and and you know what teams are dealing with this specific off season. So it's smart for Bean to let him hit the market, and it's you know a linebacker position. And as we all know, the value of that position isn't you know a top the top five list, or, but we know as Bills fans and having watched McDermott's defenses over the years, not just in Buffalo but in Carolina, that. The linebackers are key to it, and yep. he was a big piece over the last few years. But Bean and this regime, they're playing it smart. Let him hit the market. So that was expected. We shouldn't be surprised. And I know there was some kickback and some flack on Twitter for the reports and, and you know that came out through the AP. But you know what? It's the offseason. you got to expect some right. of that. And, and it's good PR. In the end, it's good PR for, for the writer there, right? <laughs> well, it, and it's why it fits for every position we're going to go through. I think that there's guys where we assume what the values are going to be. And I think those valuations, and I go through a very similar exercise. I, I, I use a lot of the resources on SpotTrack, on Over the Cap. You look at similar age, similar performance, um, the – so, you know, games played an injury standpoint, production, you round all that together, you take kind of a top five and okay, where would they fit in? What's the range of what they would get? That's going to happen this year, but there's a kind of a musical chairs element to this off season where mm -hmm. there are certain amounts of teams that have cap space and are interested in that position and they're going to sign guys for there. But let's say linebacker, there are four teams who are willing to pay 10 million plus at linebacker, but maybe there's six guys who are in that range and could be worth that money. That means two of the guys aren't going to get those paychecks. And then all of a sudden it turns into, okay, well, who else is interested? Well, this team was looking to spend five or six million. They weren't willing to go to that amount. Are they going to stretch or is the team going to guy going to have to settle? And you're going to see that over and over again at different positions. I, I know it makes sense all the numbers people throw around of what Matt Milano is worth per se. And in a normal market, it's a lot more likely he could get it. We'll see how that works out here. And I think the bills could sign guys that other teams are expecting are going to be super expensive. You're going to have a lot of deals this year where it's, Oh, how, they got him for how much? That's crazy. Yeah. And we'll hope the bills are a couple of those. And Milano's great. You know, he's been yeah. huge for the bills defense. He, once he hits the market, I think it's fair to say his value 
is going to go down, no doubt about it. And I think given some of the moves that these teams are starting to make, you know, guys that are hitting the market, not just at his position, but other positions, some some big names are going to be hitting the market. As, as you know, you've been talking about it for weeks now that, you know, there's going to be a lot of free agents that uh, hit the market and probably aren't going to get what they thought they were going to get. And, you know, Milano's at that age where he's, he's entering his prime and he's at a position that, again, isn't valued all that high. But there are guys at his position that are hitting the market as well, that are veterans, that are mature. They've been in the league. They have the experience, and they play his position. And you know what? The drop-off probably isn't all that much when you look at it, if, especially when you compare it to the contracts probably that they'll sign. And I'm, you know, I'm referencing a guy like Christian Kirksey that kind of just hit the market, right? Yeah, and it's a perfect tra- transition into guys that we'll talk about tonight. But some of it's interesting when when we started doing the prep for this. You talk about oh, we like this guy. Well, that guy's kind of interesting, and you start to think that oh, well, if Milano's thirteen million, and this guy's four million. Is he really that much less of a talent? Right. Some of these and teams like. Us having that conversation this afternoon back and forth in our notes and as we're prepping for this, that's the exact same conversation that Brandon Bean's having with Joe Shane and having with Dan Morgan. And they're going through and be like, well, I mean, this guy's pretty good. Maybe he's only 90% of Milano, but man, that's a lot less money. It's going to be interesting when those come up. Yeah, and I mean, Kirksey, I I know you've uh, done some research on him. What have you thought about him over the years? I know the Bills... They were interested in him last year. I, I cover one. We, we're the ones that broke the story that he actually <laughs> visited Buffalo. And uh, he's a guy that is played um, with Micah Hyde at Iowa. Yep. Um, a very talented linebacker, man. I went back and watched his film from this year with the Packers. I mean, he put up, man. He, he did a great job this year in Green Bay. And, um, you know, he's, a, he's a, got a hairline trigger. It's one of my thing, one of my notes from last year when I, I studied him was, he just clicks and closes. He fires his gun, as you always hear me say. Uh, he likes to play downhill. He's more of an underneath defender when you talk about coverage and whatnot. Um, but I, I really like him, man. What were your thoughts on Christian Kirksey's year in Green Bay and even prior last year when the Bills were looking at him? So he's such an interesting guy from just a production and capability standpoint because his first four years in Cleveland were phenomenal. Like just Top of the line, you know, one of those guys that we lobbied like Jordan Poyer was a, an a all pro and pro bowl snub. That's the kind of guy that Cleveland was saying, hey, you guys are missing out. This guy is a pro bowl caliber linebacker. And then all of a sudden he has two really rough years injury wise. He still played well in the games that he played. So I was really curious. It, like it made sense that Cleveland cut bait because you talked about back to back years with seven games and two games. They just couldn't afford it. They were trying to rebuild what they were doing. And he came loose, and I, I was interested, and he was kind of the the option prior to A.J. Klein that many guys were yeah. looking for. And then I was curious, hey, does he still have it? Like, are you still going to see that same thing? And I know, you know, you really yeah. found a lot of that, that he still had a lot of that. And it, I, yeah. I will say 11 games shows he's still a little of those challenges to stay healthy, and I think that's going to impact some of his market when he comes out there. But when he's on the field, he is an impact player. Yeah, I mean, some of my notes, obviously, he's a captain. He was a captain the last few years in Cleveland. Uh, you know, you mentioned how the Bills signed Klein. They signed Klein on March 20th, a three-year deal for $18 million. And they actually had Kirksey in prior to that to for that visit. And he signed with the Packers on March 16th. So um, it, it tells you that, you know, I think the Bills actually probably wanted him more than yeah. Klein. Um, but, his, he, I mean, his versatility – you know, in scheme, he's played in three fours. He's played in four threes. Again, that hairline trigger. He's physical. He wants to come downhill. You see him in coverage on a lot of these plays. You see him right here over Gronk on this play. And then he, it's a good disguise. It's actually not man coverage. He goes out wide and they throw it to the running back and he stops him right near the sticks. I mean, that's the type of guy he is. I mean, he's, he's seen it all and he comes downhill on this play. Watch him light up the running back on the check down. Like look at the depth he's playing so at. Clean. They drop into cover three. He comes down for the check down and lights up the running back. Look at it from the end zone angle. It's phenomenal. Hook the curl player. Okay. He's checking it down. Boom. Sticks him right down there. You know, after a few yard gain. He's just a, a fun guy to watch just because he makes so many plays around the ball. And that's what he did last year. He's, you know, as soon as that ball carrier uh, catches the ball, he goes and gets him. You see him right there on Johnu Smith, obviously a guy that uh, the, the, you know, a lot of Bills fans really want. He's yeah. an underneath player right there. As he pivots out wide, he gets under it and it intercepts it. I mean, 
he made a lot of plays. Like it took me a couple hours to go through his film last year. Here's one again, underneath the fender versus Cole Komet breaks on the ball. I see. I just don't think there's that much of a drop off between Matt Milano and Kirksey. If they were to bring a guy like Kirksey in. Well, and I think that's going to be the question is that, you know, it, similar challenges with staying on the field. He's a little bit older. He's going to come at a better price tag th- than what Milano is. And there's going to be that projection of can Milano stay on the field and is he healthy? And you're kind of getting a little more of that discount with Kirksey than you would with Milano. But like you have pointed out here, when they're both on the field, there's not a huge difference in what their play is. And last year in the offseason, I, I think this year is going to be a really interesting litmus test on overall free agency. Yeah. The Bills went after three early release free agents last year. Four, actually. So they had, uh, we'll talk about Wagner in a little bit here, uh, coming mm-hmm. up as another guy who's available. They had Kirksey. They went after Greg Olson. They went after Josh Norman. They only got one of those four guys. And I think that a lot of players weren't sure exactly what the Bills were going to be and how good they were going to be. And it it made more sense for Olsen to go with Russell Wilson in Seattle. That seemed like a more sure bet. Um, it made sense for Kirksey to go with Green Bay and where Preston Smith and 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 those and, uh, Z Smith out there going through what that defense was building up and Aaron Rodgers on the other side. Right. You know, it, it made sense to go through there. I think this year it could be a little bit more – that the Bills have some of that pull now that they're going to get some of those deals. That's what's fun, for guys man. To come play. Yeah, yeah. When you, you know, the Bills are a contender, and, and maybe that factored into Kirksey signing in Green Bay. Maybe he he saw that okay, they have Aaron Rodgers, and you know, obviously an experienced elite quarterback, and Josh was still kind of you know finding his way. Well, now that Josh shows he can be a top five quarterback. You know, maybe Kirksey changed his mind, and, and now, you know, again, he's getting up there in age. He's not that old, but he can still play, as you guys can see. But now, he, you know, he, maybe he's looking at the Bills and like, okay, maybe that – I think the AAV difference between what they signed Kirksey for and uh, what the Packers signed Kirksey for and what Klein signed for was like – the difference was like $500,000, I yeah. think. So, again, I, I think he's going to look at this team like, okay, I visited them last year. All what they were talking about, what they were selling, it came true. Yeah, they're a real contender and put myself in that defense. I mean, he could really shine in this defense. I'm telling you, like he can do it all. I mean, he's a little susceptible to play action, but most will linebackers, most of those guys that are, you know, trigger happy and make those disruptive plays. They're going to come into the line of scrimmage on play action passes. Sometimes their eyes are going to be a little lazy and, you know, drive down in the box on a play action fake and a tight end is going to leak on a drag route. That things, those type of things happen with those kind of linebackers. But Again, when you're looking at what Milano may be paid and what Kirksey could be paid, I don't think play-wise, on-the-field production, and even availability, I mean, even that is is factored in when you're looking at both of those players. So I like your point about that. Well, and, and it's going to come into play. So last year, like you said, uh, he sent for a one-year $6.5 million. Probably, I, I would guess you're right, that they probably offered him the A.J. Klein deal. Like, it was right. probably very similar to that, and he just wasn't sure if he wanted to sign on or if we were legit in the run that they were saying we were going to go after. So now seeing that, now maybe Micah Hyde lobbying him a little bit more matters a little bit more, um, and you're able to be in that position. I also think that teams weren't sure on his health, so now him playing 11 games, Games last year at 6.5. I think everything this year has a weird little bit of deflation in the way that this market is, besides the very top upper crust of guys who like right, those right. handful of just elite players are still going to get their money. Everybody else, you're getting kind of a discount version of what you would have got. I think Kirksey could be, I think uh, one of the guys here, Andy, was asking, I think Kirksey's going to be in that same range, maybe. They go back and instead of the the three year deal, maybe it's two years. But I think two years and eight million, two years and ten million, around four or five million a year. Um, you know, maybe give him a little bit extra up front from a signing bonus standpoint, so he gets more than the three or four million in cash this year. He gets a little bit more up front there, but it mm-hmm. makes the cap number a little bit more palatable. Right. And when you talk about that versus, you know, probably having an AAV with Milano around. 11 12 13 11, 12, and even yeah. if you're trying to get it down you're still going to eat 8 million this year um that could be the difference of being able to keep another player or not having to cut another player that everybody is so quick doing these things oh we're going to cut these eight guys and not hey those are holes you're creating in the roster yeah. um maybe getting a guy like Kirksey means keeping two or three other players 
Right. And the only only you know, drawback, I think, or hesitation I have with going and getting a guy like him, and I want you to talk about if they were to sign him before free agency, what that, what that means. Um, but if they were to go get a guy like him, and he is going to cost a few million, I mean, if you look at A.J. Klein's contract, again, I, I feel like you know, his two-year or three-year contract was to, okay, your insurance for Milano last year, uh, maybe in three uh, linebacker sets, we'll throw you in there, which you saw that a little bit, not much, last year when Milano was healthy and they used some three backs linebacker sets. Um, but I, I feel like it was insurance more so for this year where, okay, if they can't find a, a, a Will linebacker or a Sam in the Bills over front, as we're talking about in the chat, you know, they typically Milano would align to the tight end side of the formation, the strength of the formation, so that if they need to man, you know, man him up in coverage, they have him to that side and to the passing strength. But, you know, it, it makes me think that they are going into this just because of what they're paying him, Klein, that is, in AAV, that, you know, he's the starter. And we saw him play pretty well last year, but we saw how the defense had to change and needed to be tweaked. And that kind of exposed not just the defense as a whole, but they surrendered a lot of plays at tight ends. It had it factored in there. It factored into Tremaine Admin's play in coverage and versus the run. So, you know, it makes me think like, okay, right now, Klein is obviously slotted in there as a starter, especially because of what they're paying him and how he performed last year, which he performed pretty admirably. But, you know, signing a guy like Kirksey, I think it's, it's pretty slim, to be honest with you, as good as he is because of what they're paying Klein and because what they can't just cut him, right, Greg, go over those numbers and then how it affects yeah. the comp picks. So the couple different things we'll do AJ Klein real quick. When they signed him, he was, it was a three year deal. It was basically a for sure two year deal. So this year you're talking about, it's a $6 million contract, but it's 4 million in dead cap. So yeah. cutting him, you eat 4 million and you barely free up 2 million. You're not signing a replacement linebacker for $2 million. It's, you know, he's here for two years and, and he's going to be a piece of there. We obviously have seen he can be a contributing player in a rotation or in a platoon kind of setup. He, if we have him isolated in coverage, that's a problem. Um, he needs to be a run run guy and a special teams guy. Um, the good news is if we go this route and Milano leaves for the first time in forever, the Bills could be on the favorable side of the compensatory pick formula. Yes. So compensatory picks, it's a super easy equation. You have all the unrestricted free agents, so guys who are scheduled to be free agents and their contract is planned to be up. If they leave and you lose more of them than what you sign of the same scheduled unrestricted free agents, you get a comp pick. They then literally take all the guys who were signed who had a, a positive ranking of, hey, you lost more than you signed, and they just rank about who got the most money. And they do it by average annual value, and the highest money got paid out. You get a handful of third-round picks, handful of fourth-round picks. And it when people talk about the draft, they talk about it as seven rounds. It's actually always been eight rounds. There's eight rounds of the draft because they <laughs> add 32 yeah. compensatory picks. Yeah. So when you do the numbers, the math of it, 256 or whatever the number is, is actually 32 times eight, not 32 times seven. There's actually eight rounds of the draft. It's just that they make the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, and seventh bigger by adding the compensatory picks. Um, the good news is if you sign released players – they don't count against that. And there's another one. It's actually only from the start of the league year on March 17th until about May 15th. And guys who sign after that don't count. I have a feeling there's going to be an awful lot of one-year deals mm -hmm. signed May 16th or whenever that cutoff happens. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the Bills are now in a spot where we played around in the chat. And anybody who's not a member of the Cover One Premium channel, come on in and hang out with us. You, yeah. know, you could go and sign a Kirksey and a released uh, lineman and let Darrell Williams and Matt Milano go, and you could get a third and a fourth round pick for that. It's wild. It, it's, that's the kind of things and scenarios that Bean and his team are talking through. Yeah, and that's – I mean, it's something that Bean is aware of. Obviously, he oh, studies yeah. it. But even this year with the way the cap is for a lot of the teams around the league, I mean, you could really maximize and almost exploit – what is happening in a way yeah. and flip it on its head and, you know, come out on the positive side. And so good teams are going to do that. There oh, are teams, no there are teams who will not sign any scheduled unrestricted free agents will only sign release players and will recoup the, the comp picks for it. The, the Ravens and the Packers have been doing it for years. That's been their strategy in regular years, let alone in a year like this where it's going to be easier. 
Right. So now we'll transition. Tommy's asking, who's another linebacker who is comp- uh, comparable in talent? I'll let you go with a guy that I, we both kind of like him, uh, a guy yeah. from uh, the Raiders there. So th- there's a couple different guys and one that I, I, I knew of and I'd kind of poked around but was intrigued. And when you talk about the, bl- the platoon setup of adding with a guy like A.J. Klein – Nicholas Morrow, the outside linebacker for the Raiders here, was just, he's a really good athlete. He's a 26 year old guy. He was actually a college safety, about six foot, 225, ran a 4 5 coming out. Really good athlete. Played as a lot of special teams, so you can get a lot of snaps that way. Yeah. Probably isn't a guy that you want outright replacing Milano for a hundred percent of the snaps. But if you're telling me he's on the field for 60 or 70 and and Klein's for 30 or 40 of them, I think you could turn that into a workable linebacker. Yeah, I I liked him. I was pretty surprised. I I don't think he makes the splash plays that, you know, a lot of fans are expecting out of the linebacker position because we've we've had Milano, but D three player. So underdog type story started 19 of 30 games the last two seasons. 30 stops, six only six missed tackles last year, interception, and five PBUs. I, some of my notes from him were he was a steady player, you know, not flashy, but very steady, well-rounded in zone and man coverage, see ball, get ball kind of guy, good change of direction. Uh, he flashed some pass rush ability uh, for the Raiders uh, the last couple of years. Um, here's a play where he just he's just really good at leveraging the, ball, leveraging the ball. You see the ball go into the boundary here to the right side of the screen. You see him stay ahead of the block from the offensive lineman of the Colts, and then he just leverages the ball, forces it back inside. Like and that's you against see a great offensive line, too. A great offensive line, and you know he he just does this week in and week out. He just leverages the ball. You saw it on the screen play. You see him right here to the right side of the screen as they bring the ball around here to the wide receiver, keeps it inside again, um, just all the time. Watch this one down the line of scrimmage. So he's right over here. Watch him work down the line of scrimmage against the Broncos here. Works through traffic. And then just as soon as the ball cuts back, boom, he's there to make the tackle. I really like him. I thought he was a good player for the Raiders. And, um, you know, that trigger is not – it can be overwhelmed by processing. So sometimes he gets lost in his eyes a little bit, you know. Uh, Very similar to Milano in a lot of ways. And then he's another guy that's just going to dive in play action. He's You know, he can really bite hard on those play action plays, um, you know, when they – and the Raiders saw a bunch of it last year. So – I do like Morrow. I thought he was, uh, I was pleasantly surprised. He was a consistent player. Uh, again, you know, this regime, McDermott and Bean, they love those underdog stories too. Okay. D3 player. That's pretty, that's pretty impressive. Good for him. Oh, heck yeah. And it's, he's the guy, uh, Taxo here asking about the contract prediction for him. He's another step down from Kirksey. Um, so he's a guy that you're going to get consistent coverage. Like you said, real solid, not a lot of flash plays. He's not going to be, you know, causing a lot of turnovers and things like that, most likely. Um, so he's a guy that's probably more in that three million dollar range. I think that's going to be an interesting part of this offseason where, you know, that mid, mid-range veteran has been a spot that the the Patriots have manipulated for years yeah. and just giving out a little bit more than the minimum. Hey, we're not going to put you to the minimum. We'll give you a little bit more. The Bills have been one of the heaviest in that in the last two or three years. A lot of people are predicting that that middle class is going to be eliminated, and it's either going to be the, the high-paid guys yeah. or one-year veteran minimum stuff. This is a guy that in in historic years, he would get a little bit more. He's better than that veteran minimum. He's young. He's athletic. He does. He plays uh, multiple phases. He's a really strong special teams player. Yeah, That's the kind of guy that you want to give a two-year, $6 million deal. That's what all my math says. Like when you look at other comparable guys, comparable athletes, comparable age, very healthy, you know, hasn't missed games. That's the kind of guy you want to give a little bit more money to. I'm curious if that market still exists this year because he deserves more than that. But he might be one of those guys that you hear teams going like, oh, man, where do we get this guy? And fans won't think anything of him because he'll sign for like a minimum deal. So they'll assume, oh, that means he's just a scrub or just a a futures contract kind of guy. And maybe he won't even make the the team. This is a guy who's going to impact somebody's team next year. Yeah, and what I like about signing a guy like him, it's almost like addressing it in the draft where yeah. you can still groom him. You can he's a long term possibility, whereas in, you know, some of these veterans that are gonna be on the market that they could bring in to help plug a hole 
and kind of like a guy, AJ Klein, that's on the roster where, you know, long term, you're not going to be able to, you're not going to groom him as much. He's probably not going to grow as much. I think a guy like Morrow could come in and they could groom him. Bob Babbage could take him and groom yeah. him. And he's consistent. You know, that's one thing that this defense has needed at the linebacker position. The linebackers have been good the last few years. They're very athletic guys. And, you know, we always talk about that week in, week out. And when you look at the defense as a whole, I mean, they're probably per position, they're probably the most athletic across their position. So, uh, you know, corners, they've had solid corners. They've had, they have good safeties, but they're not athletic yeah. types. Admins and Milano were those guys. And that's the way it's always been in Sean McDermott defenses. So a guy like Morrow, uh, maybe not as athletic as the next guy we're going to talk, talk about in Devondre Campbell, but he does offer consistency. And that is something that can go a long way. I mean, he doesn't miss a lot of tackles. He can, uh, scrape down a line of scrimmage, work through traffic. He's got enough athleticism to be in coverage and zone or man. I was, I was, you know, surprised in, um, at his film. And he's a guy that could bring something to the Bills defense. But I, I'm talking, go ahead. Even look at the way that this might pair up. I know a guy that you you did some awesome work on here recently, Jacoby Stevens. You talk yeah. about that kind of guy. Instead, say they don't get one of the you know everybody wants him to get Zayvon Collins or to get you know Micah Parsons or whoever some crazy draft yeah. guy to, to go in the first round. Um, say they don't go that route and they end up with a guy like a Stevens that hey we think he has potential but he's probably not coming in and playing heavy snaps year one no and all of a sudden you have a guy like Morrow who platoons with Klein this year and they're the the combination of snaps that we cobble it together to replace mm-hmm. Milano then next year Klein's deal is very easy to get out of it's no dead cap you can let him walk yeah. and we get all six million dollars back now all of a sudden maybe a guy like uh, Jacoby's ready to play mm-hmm. well, a little bit more and then maybe he's the 30 or 40 percent with Morrow being the 60 or 70 percent and that's the new play platoon tandem that's there because you let that later round guy develop and he's ready a guy like Morrow could be that bridge between the two uh to let Klein move on and all of a sudden he's the third rotational guy or they get a higher round pick next year or whatever that kind of guy I could see him being that bridge between those two worlds yeah and another guy we're gonna stick at linebacker just because you know, again, Milano is going to be a big loss and Klein, again, he's going to be, you know, he's going to hit or miss in a lot of different plays next year. Um, but a guy that, you know, we've been talking about for a few months now, and that's Devondre Campbell. This guy, you know, I, I, I watched him when he was with the Falcons, but I didn't watch him as closely since he's left them. And so when I got to watch his film today, I mean, I was, I fell in love. I did fall in love. Now I will admit that I think, I would be surprised that if the Bills use a 6'4 linebacker at their will or Sam position. It just, those guys, is, you know, they're great. They're athletic. Edmonds, you see, he's athletic. Devondre Campbell's super athletic as well and long, and he can cover some ground. But their Sam or Will linebackers got to have a, a good amount of change of direction. And guys at that size just lumber to immediately change direction. And so I would be surprised if they bring a guy like Campbell in. I would be surprised if they draft a Zavin Collins as productive as he was at Tulsa. But I mean, six, four, 232 pounds. He's a four, Running five, a eight. Four, five, yeah. Yeah. Like fast. He had 102 tackles last year for the Cardinals. 36, uh, 36 stops, two sacks. Uh, again, super athletic, uh, comfortable in space. He has, for, again, for his size, he has good change of direction, much like Edmonds. Uh, has some man-to-man capabilities with tight ends. Uh, you see him up at the line of scrimmage disrupting tight ends. But the further you get downfield, the more he's going to be exposed. I mean, there were plays where they were running running backs with tight ends down the seam, and he was getting beat in that first 5 to 10 yards, but he would make up for it with his speed you know, at the catch point. He did that a couple times last year. Uh, size and length to play stack linebacker. You guys got to remember, Milano a lot of times, as you saw me break down this year, a lot of times Milano was stacked over the A gaps based on formations and almost like a quasi Mike linebacker. So, you know, his size, his length, his long arms, being able to play inside and stack and shed is, is a, you know, it's a good appeal. It's an appeal for teams that need a guy like him, plays downhill, and he, he uses his hands really well to, to uh, beat and, and, and destruct blocks. So, what do your what did you like about Campbell and you know what do you see AAV wise for a guy like him? So it's interesting. I, I've used him as kind of an abstract example for over a year now mm-hmm. because when people were like, Oh, well, you can't just go find these linebackers anywhere, you have to pay Milano. I'm like, Well, 
Did you guys see Devondre Campbell set on the market for like he didn't sign with Arizona for a while last yeah. year, and that I actually wanted him instead of AJ Klein <laughs> as the guy. Yeah. He was one of my targets when I did like my my mock wish list off season last year, um, and we went through. I'm like, well, if a guy like that signs for one year and six million, he's not that different than Milano. Like that's you know that there's they're not the same players. They're not a a one for one comparison. But when you have that kind of ability. Hey, maybe there is a chance to be a little bit more economical here to kind of keep track of that. So I, I think you're in the same boat here. And I, I think you pointed out he's probably not quite as instinctual as what Kirksey is, but he's also probably one of the best athletes of the guys that we're looking I mean, look at, at here. This. Look at him. Look at him right here. Look at him work. He, you know, see, look where his helmet's looking. He's looking this way. He's watching this down block occur. So here comes a down block. Here's a puller, right? Watch him process this. Look at his feet. I mean, this guy's 6'4", 230 pounds. Look at his feet. Look at the quickness. Look at him get outside, then get down the line scream. Like, that's really good change of direction. Again, it's a little different change of direction when you're talking stopping a gap run or against a puller than when you're out in coverage, again, in you know short area versus those slot receivers versus those tight ends like Darren Wall or, or Travis Kelsey, right? Oh, yeah. And it's, it's going to be this kind of guy that we're – I think Campbell coming in the same with with Kirksey. You're not talking about a platoon. Those guys would come in and replace yeah. Milano from a snap count standpoint. Uh, we would still play Klein. They still might draft a guy to develop. But if you sign Campbell or Kirksey, it would be at a discount. But they would be coming in and playing in the two two linebacker sets. They're not leaving the field. They're they're going to be there. And we would just have to be able to manage from a coverage standpoint. Maybe you would get to where an obvious passing downs. You'd finally have a six DB come onto the field. We haven't seen much of that in, in these uh, last couple of years, uh, but it, it's something where I think they would be more one for one replacements where if they go with a Morrow or if they go with, you know, a, a draft guy that you might see more of a platoon with Klein in this scenario, Klein would be just a, a third linebacker in my mind. Yeah, and John, one of my best friends growing up back in LP, back in Lockport, shout out to Lockport. Uh, he says he's a three, four inside backer. It's funny that you say that because you've heard me reference Edmonds and I know Sal Capaccio is a big you know, Edmonds is, he would be the ideal inside linebacker, uh, in a three, four defense. Campbell's uh, along those lines as well. But you, you got to remember that Campbell played in a four, three defense in Atlanta and he played the same exact position that Milano played in this defense. Uh, it's a very, it's not as, uh, cover three oriented, but as far as uh, positions, alignments and, and stuff like that, it, it's, it's the same thing for Campbell. And, you know, look at him right here. I love how he works the traffic right here. You see the running back fly out wide, but watch him change direction. So he's got the running back out wide here as he swings out wide. Here comes a guy across the middle. Now watch the change of direction. Boom, plants his foot and goes and gets that tight end that's coming across the middle. Like you see this type of stuff all the time from him. Here he is against uh, against a tight end right at the goal line. Again, stack. Look at the pads of the the tight end there. Look at him get pop up. That's how how much pop he has in his hands. He's able to shed and make the tackle on the goal line. I like him. I like him near the line of scrimmage. Uh, here's the the pass I was telling you about. I think he's right here in the seam. You're gonna see him get beat down the seam, but he makes it up at the catch point. You see, look at that that recovery speed. I mean, that's that's a good play by him. I, I oh, like yeah. him as a linebacker. I just again, I I would be surprised if the Bills go to another guy with his size and his traits for their Sam Will linebacker in this defense. Well, and, and that's going to be interesting. Like you said, they, they, we talk about Moro is a very similar comp to Milano. College safeties, six foot, 225, can probably bulk up to 230, 235, depending on the program, but is more in that same mold from an athlete standpoint. Devondre Campbell is a very good athlete, but built differently. You see, he almost is, is kind of thin through the hips and through the legs yeah. and almost kind of top heavy, but he moves well. His feet are very quick. So it's going to be interesting to see those archetypes is that the Bills are usually pretty, you know, disciplined to that. We know what they like at tight end. We know what they like at certain positions. Is that something they're willing to bend on a little bit? I'm curious to see because uh, he would be one that I'd be interested for them to make an exception on. Yeah, and you've heard us say after the Chiefs game that the Bills defense has to evolve. I mean, they were too predictable in their coverages towards the end of the year. And when the offense you know, dictated the coverage that, you know, needed to be played when they went, had to go to man coverage against the Chiefs. What happened? Travis Kelsey went off. Yeah. Tyreek Hill went off. Their weapons and their speed took over, which is why you heard the coaches and Brandon Bean reference that after the season. So 
Let's talk about some speed. Let's talk about some athletes at another position that uh, you know a lot of guys are talking about in the chat, and that's cornerback. Who is a guy that stood out to you at the cornerback position? So there's a couple guys here that that are interested, and for some reason, I, I have a strong interest in the San Francisco 49ers defensive yeah. backfield. That three of the guys that I'm interested in are, are from, from their team. It's um, not a bad. It's not a bad thing. I mean, yeah. they play a good mix of press. They play a lot of bail technique. They play a lot of cover three. I mean, it, it, those two guys, J, uh, Jason Barrett, J, Jason yeah. Verrett, and Akella Witherspoon, is who you're referencing, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's something where, you know, two different ends of the spectrum here, very similar to what we're talking about with Morrow versus maybe a, a Kirksey. You know, people know Verrett's name more in, in what he was able to finally get healthy and play. Akella Witherspoon is interesting. He would be similar to our discussion on Devondre Campbell. He's he's really tall. I've seen measurements at 6'2 or 6'3, depending on where it's at. Really long arms. Also mm-hmm. ran a 4'4'5. Four, four, really Crazy. good athlete coming out of Colorado. So that, you know, 4'4'5, four, four, a 40 and a half inch vertical. And he's six two, you know, and has long arms and big hands. Like that, it sounds perfect to me in the the zone heavy scheme and his ability to make plays on the ball here. But we do, we haven't seen them lean that way. We haven't oh. seen them go to a lot of those kind of guys. I'd love to see them break out of that a little bit because. He checks so many boxes for me to get a little more athleticism, a little more size, not having the, you know, Preston Williams of the world and Devontae Parkers of the world just kind of big boy our receivers. I'd love to have a guy that when we get in those spots, like, no, Witherspoon can hang with him from an athletic standpoint, a size standpoint. So it intrigues me in some of those traits. Yeah, you talked about his athleticism, a 9.79 RAS. Uh, I mean, his length, you said 33 inch arms. I mean, that is used to uh, affect the catch radius. His vert, his 40 and a half vert is in the 92nd percentile. Uh, his size is great. His athleticism is great. It's good, for, especially for the Bills' sake. If we're talking scheme fit and coming from the Niners and, you know, playing some of that press, pay, playing some of that bail cover three, um, that's good for the Bills because he's a guy with his size and athleticism. He can match up versus those bigger receivers, something that Levi Wallace has struggled with, something that Trey White has struggled with to a certain degree. And as you saw in a couple of those clips, he's very good at those back shoulder passes and getting his body and using his length to defend those back shoulder passes like you're going to see here. And he's a guy that, you know, with his size, I mean, you remember last year when the Bills played the Dolphins in those couple games, the guy that ate them apart was their tight end, Mike Gesicki. Obviously, a a very talented, athletic tight end, and that's something the Bills struggled with last year. I mean, he had something like 21 or 22 targets against the Bills. A lot of times, they line him up out wide and, you know, ran wide receiver routes with him versus Levi Wallace, and Levi Wallace was getting beat, you know, nothing crazy, but he was getting beat inside where he was expecting leverage. But this is what I like about Witherspoon, not just his size, but you see him in a bail technique to the top here. Look at him take that guy deep, but then as this pass goes to this receiver right here, Watch the footwork as he plants. There's no wasted footwork right there. Like plant and and he gets downhill like that's smooth. That is very smooth footwork. There's no wasted footwork there. Now the receiver makes a catch, but he's right there to make the tackle. And that length allows him to be physical with wide receiver. Bottom of the screen, you're going to see him press up on that guy in that contact box, make a play on the ball. Like he's someone that does this all the time. Here he is. I went back and like I got so involved in his film, Greg, that I was going into 2019 the playoffs when he played Diggs and Thielen. Yeah. And, you know, this is a play against Diggs where he gets a flag late. He's flagged here late in the play, but I thought it was weak. Both of the guys were fighting there, but look at him meet Diggs at the line of scrimmage. He's not afraid of Diggs getting him deep yeah. here. He how, gets him how right much at the would, line of scrimmage. How much would that kind of physicality of the line of scrimmage look good in that AFC championship game? Yeah, no, you exactly, know? man. And, and again, you know, if you watch this entire game, I watched, every, you know, all of the plays here, uh, against the Vikings uh, with Witherspoon and Thielen got him on a quick slant. He gave him a little crossover. It's something that he struggled with. He struggled with a little bit, but I mean, Thielen and Diggs, they're going to get you probably more times than not, but he was not afraid of him. He was not afraid of Diggs. He was not afraid of Thielen in a big game. And I like, I like, you know, adding a guy like him again, but they will have to break some tendencies because they normally don't draft guys. They normally don't bring guys in with that type of size and that type of length and athleticism. But again, the defense has to evolve and having a guy with that length and the feet that he has, I mean, it's, it'd be nice to have, especially even if they are staying in their zone coverages, the length, his ability to affect passing lanes and passes and throws 
goes a long way. I mean, look at how, Tremaine Edmonds over the last few yeah. years. Well, talk about one of the guys who's uh, one of our friend Aaron's favorite names uh, this offseason that's been tagged with the Bills, Richard Sherman. When you go on that, I play on the mock draftable site a lot yeah, where it shows the to. webs yeah. of how it overlaps. Yeah. Uh, Akella Witherspoon's number one comp is Richard Sherman. Richard Sherman. And because they check every single box except Witherspoon's a little bit faster. Now, obviously, Richard Sherman's been one of the smartest and you know most uh, – insightful cornerbacks mm-hmm. in the league while he's been there. So it's unfair to compare anybody else to have that understanding of quarterbacks and how to react. But to have a guy who checks all those measurable boxes and is more of an athlete, that's intriguing to have in this kind of spot. And we've seen, you know, I like Levi Wallace. I think that he's done incredibly well for himself to be a walk-on and now a UDFA and going through everything that he's done. Uh, but I wouldn't mind having somebody come in to be able to, identify that kind of competition but have some of the traits he doesn't have rather than another you know everybody's excited about dane jackson dane jackson's another levi wallace like he's Mm -hmm. tough and good and and gonna you know through everything but he's not a special athlete he doesn't have any special traits he's just another levi wallace that will outperform his draft spot probably but isn't going to be special i'd love to take a stab at a guy who has some special traits um as we kind of pivot into some of the other ones here we have some guys asking about the defensive line um an area that everybody, obviously, we talked about J.J. Watt, and don't get me wrong, I would love if the Bills find a way to yes, add J.J. Yeah. Watt. That'd be delightful. Um, if they don't, I, I think this is an area that's going to be really interesting this year where we may be able to find some values and that this is a guy really similar to what we talked about with Morrow and honestly the same as Akella Witherspoon. In normal years, they would deserve some money in that mid, mid middle class area. Samson uh, uh, Abubu a bookum. A bookum. Okay. A bookum. Um, I wasn't going to try. That's why I was Samson like, you know, you it up. <laughs> E-B-U-K-A-M. Samson Abukum, um is a guy who is a, probably more of a, a pass rush specialist, maybe not an every down defensive end, uh, but is a guy who has a lot of potential. The Rams are in a tough spot to be able to bring back any of their free agents. They're having a lot of cap issues. Obviously, they just made another trade for Stafford and ate money on the Jared Goff deal. Um, he's the kind of guy that I think – many teams would be in position to re-sign and bring back on their own, and they may not be able to do that. He's a guy that I think could be interesting, especially when you talk about pairing with some of the bigger, heavier-handed power defensive ends that we have. I wouldn't mind having a guy like him, 6'3", 245, ran a 4'5", 39-inch vert, some athleticism and explosion coming off, and he didn't have a ton of opportunity, but 20 pressures and only 179 pass rush snaps. Anytime you're having more pressure than one in every 10 pass rush snaps you're talking about some higher end efficiency and maybe some untapped potential yeah 20 pressures you know four and a half five sacks something like that uh i like you you know that you mentioned he's kind of a tweener guys he's a 6'3 245 pound you know outside linebacker edge player they played you know under brandon staley they played a pretty hybrid type defense and so sometimes he was in a two point, sometimes he was in a three point, sometimes he was the fifth man on the line of scrimmage as an outside linebacker. Sometimes he was, you know, hand in the dirt, you know, fourth down lineman, uh, good special teamer. Uh, some of my notes are a blue collar type. He attacks down the line of scrimmage on runs away from him. Strong balance and hands at the point of attack. You saw a bunch of those uh, early clips that I just sent, you know, where he, he actually played the run quite well and set a good edge. Um, I See, my issues with him, when I looked at his pressures, when I looked at some of his sacks, as you'll see here, they were kind of contained rush sacks. And that's not a bad thing. It's more of a Mario Addison type role. Sure. And why is that? Because... You know, like Jerry Hughes is a guy that, you know, as we saw where he lost some contain sometimes where he is the guy that is allowed off the edge. Hypothetically, this is Jerry Hughes. He's a guy that's allowed to come off the edge full speed and really just go get the quarterback. And then the guy opposite him, usually the opposite defensive end or edge defender, kind of like Abukam here, uh, you see him just kind of wait. And obviously, you know, the guy for the Rams is Donald. He's the one that would be yeah. creating the pressure. And you see him create that pressure right there, slide the quarterback to his left, and that quarterback feels the pressure. And here he is on the outside just kind of cleaning up. And some of his sacks were of that nature, which – I don't think he's a natural pass rusher. Uh, I think you see here, again, you see that pressure from Darnold, uh, Donald. I'm sorry, not Darnold. Uh, Donald right here coming out wide. He's playing at high. That means he's got to kind of have to stay home and not go as deep as the quarterback. And he's able to, you know, bring down Kyler Murray there. So if you look at the quality of his sacks and pressures, a lot of that came, 
you know, from other guys being the pressure guy. Here's, uh, I think this is Floyd coming off the edge against his RPO look or play action look. And he's sitting out here wide and you see him kind of just clean up there. So yeah. I like him. I think he ha- he's that blue collar type that, you know, the Bills would like to have. But I, and I think he has a role in the Bills defense, um, especially when you talk about his motor and hustle. But uh, what are you projecting uh, money wise for a guy like him? I think he would be a cheaper guy, maybe three or four million dollars. And again, that's in a normal year. He might be a guy you get on a one year, two million dollar deal because he wants to try to rebuild his value and then come back the following year. You know, a lot of people are going to be out there asking for, you know, if we don't get JJ Watt, well, that means we should go after, you know, either the high end guys in Gakwe or Shaq Barrett or even the next tier. A lot of people like Romeo Okora or Carl Lawson mm-hmm. or, or Tyus Bowser. Those are great names. I'd be happy to get those guys. They're going to cost you $10 million a year. You know, in is that where we're going to spend that money this year? It's going to be interesting to see that. This is a guy that you could get on the cheap where you're then banking on. We're probably keeping Addison. You're hoping for a step forward from Epinesa. And this guy's chipping in as the third or fourth guy, and you're going to pay him like that. And maybe there's upside, but you're going to pay him at the $2 million range to then get a little bit more. Really appreciate you, Randy. It means a lot. Yeah, no, he's uh, he was fun to watch. Uh, I, I think again, you, when you break down his film, you'll see you know what his role was, and yeah. again, it's a role in the Bills' defense. It has been since you know this regime has come here, and a lot of people don't realize that both defensive ends aren't just gung ho to the quarterback on passing plays. Sometimes you have a guy that is rushing high, and he he does the back shoulder of the quarterback as they set up in the pocket, and you have a low rusher, and uh, again. For the Rams, more times than not, Donald was the guy that was pressuring uh, the quarterback, and then everyone else was kind of cleaning up. Obviously, everyone eats yeah. off of what Donald oh, does yeah. and the dis- disruption that he brings. So talking well, about it, – go ahead. It, it, it's interesting. One thing to add, I think that there's two different scenarios we'll have here with our pass rush. I would love to have that Stephon Diggs effect. The, the guy who just was a domino effect that all of a sudden Beasley's job is easier. John Brown's job is easier. Gabe Davis job is easier because you added a guy at the top. I think the Bills have the pieces in their pass rush, you know, quartet to all of a sudden have that kind of energy unlocked if you added a top end guy. It may not be in the cards to do that. We may need to do it from the other end in the draft or with a lower end value guy where we still need that. And we need Oliver to be the guy that helps everybody else eat or we need one more good year out of Hughes. Ideally, it would be awesome if you plugged in a Watt or a high end guy that all of a sudden now Hughes would be ideal as a secondary pass rusher playing off of somebody else and then allowing Oliver to have more, you know, less attention towards him. But I'm curious to see if they can pull that off at the you know second most expensive position in the league besides quarterback right and you know we're talking about Aaron Donald and some of the defensive linemen um, one guy that stood out to me um, that I'd like to hear so your opinion on it, opinion on is uh, Devin Gacho uh, yeah. defensive tackle uh, from the Dolphins uh, was kind of banged up the last uh, this last year but he's been a three-year starter for the Dolphins and a guy that Joe Shine he knows because he was in Miami yeah. when they drafted him in the fifth round and the guy right after him that they drafted was Vincent Taylor, a guy that also is on the yeah. free agent market and who the Bills brought in last year. So what were your thoughts on him? And then I'll, I'll give you my two cents on what I saw in film from him. So Gacho is a guy, you know, a lot of times you think of those run stuffing guys as your, you know, Ted Washington or you're just enormous monsters of a guy. There's a few guys that we looked at here that do it from a technique and a leverage and their ability yeah. to hold the point when they're not 350 pounds. Now, Gacho is not a small guy. He's 6'3", 315. So he's not some little guy, but he is an athletic 315. Like he is a well-built 315. He's not a heavy, you know, big bellied guy. So his ability to have strong footwork and to, you know, right here, you look at him being able to hold up at the point of attack, get off of mm-hmm. a block. You know, a lot of times you're thinking of those guys as, you know, getting the start of Tule. You're talking, he sets his feet and it's, you can't move him off of his spot. He's not necessarily flowing with you per se. If you get him moving, that's not necessarily a good thing for him. Um, so I'm, I'm interested to see, does he have that? Can he stay healthy? Can he get back there? He'd be a value guy that I think we could get fairly cheap, but would be an upgrade to be able to combine with star you know not putting all our eggs in the basket the star is ready to come back for some huge snap count 
Yeah, I mean, he kind of lost his job last year, I'll say. He kind of lost his job last year. I think it was a bicep injury or uh, upper arm injury. Uh, he only had, had 172 snaps in 2020, and he was re- replaced by a, you know a, a good draft pick in Raekwon Davis. And, yes, they, they invested uh, a ton in their D-line. Yes, and Zach Sealer kind of came up and, and, and really grabbed the position. Uh, he's kind of limited as a pass rusher, only 48 total pressures in just over three years. But again, he's plays nose tackle, so keep that in mind. He can bump out a little bit from time to time, but more times than not, you're going to see him as a shade nose tackle. Um, strong run defender. He was number one in run stops in 2019 as a starter. Again, a starter for three years. So as you'll see in this clip, and, and if there's one guy that is happy that this guy, this defensive tackle, may not be back in the AFC East uh, and have to face him anymore. It's Mitch Morse. When Mitch Morse played against him in week two, uh, he was, I mean, Gacho had, he ate his lunch, man. He just took it and it took his, his lunch money on the way out. Like, he just plays with such good, consistent, strong hands. His placement is always on point. Anchors at the point of attack, as you saw in a couple of those plays. He has stack and shed ability. And watch on this play. As the uh, the Bills and Cody Ford try to a little combo here, and you'll see Ford try to feed him over to Morse, Morse right there. But look at the pad level. Look at the technique. He drops his near knee. That is technique right there. That's textbook. Drops that. That that combo block dissipates, and then just watch him throw Mitch Morse here. Just get off of me and go make the tackle. Minimize that. <laughs> like he plays like with such good pad level in his hands. Look at his hands on these combination blocks. Boom, he just lands them and just just you know releases and makes tackles in the backfield. Like, he's so good. He's not a guy that's just going to, as you said, anchor with his size and, his, and the wideness of his body, but he's a guy that can, you see him almost two gap in here. You see him peek back right here, make sure that the quarterback doesn't have it. He's playing with his eyes in that hole, but then as the ball you know, hits the entry point with the running back, boom, he disengages, makes the tackle. Dude, he was fun to watch. Uh, all of these clips, that does not look like a 315 pound man. It, it just, it, he's so, he's really well built from an athletic standpoint that you, he just doesn't look like your normal 315 pound nose tackle, but here he is fighting off combo blocks and being Expressive able to manage people. that. It's crazy. Yeah, like his power is intriguing. And that's a spot where, like you said, all those draft picks and, you know, obviously we know the investments that, that, uh, Miami has made on that front. He's the kind of guy that might get to walk, and he's intriguing because he just turned 26, has three really good seasons, and then one season where he kind of got beat out. He might be a really nice value to sneak out of there and be able to add in a guy. And that part of that pitch is, hey, you know those guys who gave away your spot, you want to come back and stick it to them twice a year. Um, he's the kind of guy that might be a nice combination, and then. If you have that, you know, we're all hoping the star comes back and is at the level that he was before. If he's not, this is a fantastic insurance policy and ideally is that guy who can play with Ed Oliver for years to come after, you know, hopefully we get one more year on a star here. Yeah, if there's one guy on the defensive side that I fell in love with the last few days watching free agents, it's this guy because, like I said, he, I think he's going to have a chip on his shoulder. I think he's going to come at a, good, a decent price, and he's produced in this league. And, again, the, the front office and Joe Shine, he's familiar with him. Again, he was in Miami when they drafted this guy. So I think he's a guy that he you could really bring in. And, again, we don't know, you know, with Star yeah. and his situation. Um, he's a guy on top of Kawan Shore, obviously, those – sure. You know, the, they're obviously linked to him. It's just a Carolina connection, but and this other guy links, has more left. Oh, yeah. It, well, you talk about other things. Vincent Taylor, who was the only guy who was released last year from the Bills to get claimed by another team. The Browns claimed him and had him there. We actually stole him from the, the Dolphins. Um, so he's the guy that's out there. Um, you know, some names you talk about, if they go a little bit more money, Shelby Harris is a name that gets thrown around. Um, if he's all coming the, off injury, though, right? I yes. Think he had a pretty big injury last year. Same idea. But he's good. He's a good. guy that if if he is a cap casualty, if Akeem Hicks became available, that is just a monster of a human. 6'4", 352 pounds, one of the only remaining guys there, but older and coming off of injury as well. Gacho is the perfect mix of the kind of guy that I think still has a little bit left and could be a good investment for that low end yeah. and being able to have that combination is 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 really exciting so we, we've talked a lot about the defensive <laughs> side of the ball here um maybe we should pivot over to a little bit of the offense i i do think that more of the bills attention is going to be on the defense obviously the bills offense yeah. was outstanding last year so i don't expect a ton of big shifts there but one area that obviously has been you know, a, a little bit of a sore spot. We never quite figured out a way to use uh, TJ Yeldon the way that some people wanted. I think that there's 
you know, you you and Anthony did a fantastic job of showing why the issues in the run game was more with the offensive line and the scheme that's there. But even with that, I, I think there are maybe a couple spots in the skill set with Singletary and Moss that we don't quite have. Having either a guy with some explosion or explosion and some receiving skills would be really exciting. And I know a guy you were interested in was Matt Breida. Yeah, I mean, he's young. I know he's bounced around a little bit the last Phenomenal few years. Athlete. Yeah, I mean, he is. I mean, when we talk about change of pace uh, compared to Singletary and, and Moss. I mean, he's that guy. He is a guy whose speed will change the angles of defenders trying to leverage him. That is the main thing with a guy that has speed. You know? And he comes from, you know, the Dolphins, and he kind of underperformed. And he's a guy I think the Bills could bring in on almost more of like a, a prove it, a cheap oh, prove yeah. it type uh, deal. Potentially even a veteran minimum. Yeah, yeah. So he's a good fit, too, when you talk about his career and playing in zone schemes. Obviously, Chan Gailey last year, that's a lot, they ran that a lot. And you're going to see some of these clips when I get to them. So his speed changes angles. And I think what, if you're having that guy come in as like a running back three, that change of pace guy, that guy you could throw some screens to, he's the type of guy that you can maximize his touches because may, he may only get now three to five touches in the game, but two of those touches could be explosive plays, as you'll see in some of this film. Well, and, you know, a guy out of Georgia Southern wasn't a big time. He wasn't even invited to the combine, but ran a four three eight at his pro day. And that matchup, he's one of the guys that always pops on the um, – I'm drawing a blank. The the NFL where they do the tracking, next gen, show, yeah, yeah, the next gen, the miles per hour. I think two separate times he's had the fastest miles per hour on the season yep. uh, for for any player. So he not only is a four three eight guy from part. a track standpoint, he shows it on the field and it translates to his explosiveness on the field. I I certainly got burned from a fantasy standpoint. I thought <laughs> I thought he was going to kill it in Miami this last year. I thought he was going to take that job and run with it. And I don't really know why that didn't mesh out they needed a running back um but he's he wasn't able to get it figured out in miami to the way that they were looking for uh even with some of these highlights yeah i mean look at this screenplay again you know the bills need to do better in the screen game especially to the running backs i mean you see this little screen here versus the the niners right here look at him take it and he, he uses his blocker but watch him just pull away from defenders uses a blocker there and this guy is in the alley ready to make the tackle and he just bounces it on him with his speed like and just turns the corner on him like that's the type of speed the bills are missing at you know the running back position and i am not one that a guy that says you know they need a speed guy they have to have a speed guy no i i I think they need to change a pace guy and yes you know sometimes when you're talking uh, about that it is speed but i also think they need a receiving type threat at running back and i think if you're talking the screen game i think brita could do that i don't think he's the type of guy that you would really want to line up out wide at you know as a receiver in, in the passing game though yeah and i think that he would you know again he's cheap he's the guy that you would bring in just from uh that change of pace standpoint i think that he maybe even has some kick return ability for maybe not punt return but literally kickoff return mm-hmm. um so some of those kind of things is just some possibilities there um but an interesting one where i think he can be had cheap and if it doesn't work out you're not worried about some lost investment yeah, it's just maximize a guy like that's touches. I, I would love to see them get someone that, you know, can touch the ball just a few times. And, you know, what we've been talking about at the running back position and even the wide receiver position is kind of consolidating some of those roles, yeah. right? Some of the, the RB, RB3 roles, the special teams roles, the gadget guy. If they could find a guy, I'm not saying Breed is that guy, but if they can find a guy like CJ Marable, like yeah. one of the, like Zach Hicks and Russ uh, interviewed the other day from, uh, Coastal Carolina, if they can get a guy like that that merges several positions, I think it's time that they do that. I think they need to, uh, you know, tie up to the, not tie up some of their positions anymore of just special teams guy. They need to start thinking about consolidating some of those roles. Yeah, one guy that some people have thrown out there is a guy from the Lions, Jamal Agnew, mm-hmm. that is a combination of those things. They, they've listed him all over the place, running back, wide receiver. They, they even have him listed at cornerback somewhere for some reason. Um, he's a returner. Last year had 13 catches, six rushes, different spots, and, and a guy, you know, he's bigger than Isaiah McKenzie, but also just as explosive, 4-3-4 four, four guy and, and can really move around. And that's a spot where if you could take Andre Roberts' roster spot, Isaiah McKenzie's roster spot, TJ Yeldon, roster spot and make that one spot on game day all of a sudden that's flexibility to be able to add in another piece somewhere yep. else and to be able to have those different options it, you know in your mid john bringing it up here Cordero patterson is not perfect. a joke like that's not a joke like that's the kind of guy that he had 
Multi, he was a running back for the Bears mm-hmm. in multiple spots last year. The Vikings kind of used him that way. The Patriots kind of figured that out. That's the kind of guy that I wouldn't hate that to have like, him as a kick return, he, part return. He's, he's, he's a unique talent. He's, one of the best returners crazy, of all time. Athlete. Crazy. One athlete. of the best returners of all time. Obviously a guy that played wide receiver, played running back. I just flash back to the night game against the Patriots where they lined up in 22 personnel, put him at, on the dot in the backfield, and ran – outside zone boss zone ran him outside like he could really fill he's like the perfect guy for all those roles that you mentioned the mckenzie role the rb3 role the special teamers like i wonder what he's gonna cost though that's the only thing he's a veteran he's been in the league for a few years and we understand special teams and what he brings as far as that impact is Uh, i wonder what he's gonna cost though that's my only worry the, the weird part is you're talking about, you know, maybe his fifth team in six years. Mm-hmm. So he went Minnesota, Oakland, New England. Now, two years in Chicago. Chicago's not in a great spot from a, from a cap standpoint. They, so it may not be that they don't want him. And maybe they don't have the luxury of being able to afford him. And he may, if he's going to play for cheap, he may not want to play for cheap for the Bears. If he's going to play for cheap, he may want to play for a contender. And all of a sudden. Hello. The, the Bills will finally, <laughs> for the first time in our adult life, Check. <laughs> we're going to get those cheap guys who are looking big. Well, screw it. If I'm going to play for one year, I want it to be with Josh Allen in this offense, with this team that's going to go in the playoffs. I'll try to make some more money next year being able to do those things. You know, he's he's about to turn 30. I think he's still got one or two more of those years left in him. Um, he's the kind of guy, I don't think it's crazy that you could get him, uh, honestly, for a one-year <laughs> minimum deal or for like a if you threw him a second year they had a little bit more uh out there he i I think there's a chance he's going to be one of those guys in the kind of position that's almost lost by the wayside of what normally would have been a decent payday last year he played for a one-year five million dollar deal um i'm sure that's you're consolidating some positions so you got to take that as a factor too and heck look at what we paid andre roberts last year we were paying andre roberts three million and change um so you talk about those different combinations if you can take tj yeldon's money andre roberts money isaiah mckenzie's money turn that into one spot you could give him if somebody throws him three or four million dollars from a winning team I think that's a I think that's a the kind of deal that you could be able to get here. I think John's spot on. Two years and eight million, three million of it guaranteed. You give him that up front. I, I think that you're able to set that up with those two years that can look clean on the salary cap. You you know, you do it as a veteran minimum for a contract from a salary standpoint with a three million dollar signing bonus, spread that out over the two years. He he's like a two and a half million dollar cap hit, but he gets four million dollars in his pocket in year one. And if he's good, he comes back the next year and he he gets you know five and a half million from that standpoint when the cap goes back up. Um, I'd be excited if they were able to make a player like him work. Right, and so let's kind of transition to the offensive line. Uh, some of the news that dropped this uh, last couple of days was obviously the Packers letting not just Kirksey go, but they let Rick Wagner, the right tackle, yeah. go too. Uh, so, what are your thoughts on him? You know, n- numbers wise, where is he going to fit? And it, obviously, uh, what do you think about him? You know, being thrown into the Bills system, he's uh, someone that they were interested in a few years back, right? Yeah, they had him in for a visit. Uh, he's the kind of guy that um, I I don't want to say he's not. Mitch Morris, but he's that kind of guy where he has footwork, he can pass block. If you ask him to anchor against a bigger, stronger guy, it's not going to be pretty. Yeah. He's not going to help in the run game. He'd be a band aid for me with a, a day one, day two pick that maybe you're wondering, hey, is this rookie ready to come in day one? He would not be a replacement for me with Daryl Williams, no. but I could see him maybe as a platoon and ideally. I don't think that we're going to get anything from Ty and Secchi again. I think that he's no. he's done. So we we literally have one tackle on the roster. Mm-hmm. Deion Dawkins is it. So we we don't need a tackle. We need two tackles. Um, I'm not banking that Trey Adams is ready to do that. I'm not a huge Ryan Bates guy. Maybe he – I wasn't an Ike Bakker guy either, and Bakker no. surprised me and was okay. Yeah. Um, maybe Bates can be that swing tackle guy. I wouldn't mind a guy like Wagner with – 
honestly, I think you and I are both on the train of pick, use pick 30. G- give me the best available tackle in the first I'm round. Always at 30, yes. And then Rick Wagner is a lovely swing tackle. Like he would be a perfectly fine third tackle. And I'll give him three or four million dollars to be a nice insurance policy. And that if you lose a guy for a game and you need Rick Wagner to play, you know, a hundred snaps over the year or two games worth, you could do worse there. I don't want him for 16 games, but I wouldn't oh. hate him on the roster. Oh, and, you know, he's coming from Green Bay. So Aaron Rodgers at the helm, they get the you know rid of the ball quickly. They run a lot of play action, a lot of bootlegs that kind of hide some of his his warts and issues and pass protection. And I'll, I'll talk some of his weaknesses real quick and then give you some of his positives, which there really weren't many on film. Because I, <laughs> I like I said, I think Aaron Rodgers he covered up a lot of his his sure. mistakes. Same uh, way Manning and Marino used to. Yes. Their lines look great, but the ball's out so quick. It doesn't matter. I, I equated his movement skills. You know, he's 6'6", so he's a tall drink of water. It's very similar to Ike Bakker at 6'6", but obviously Bakker plays uh, left guard, and he played right tackle at Iowa. But tall drink of water, his a lot of the defenders and pass rushers would get up under his pads and drive him back. Doesn't play with good leverage because he is so tall. His pad level is just way too high. He's a vertical setter, and if you guys don't really know what that is, um, a lot of his vertical sets, his sets are usually depth. They gain depth. If you guys remember Juan Castillo, the Bills' former offensive line coach, he was a guy, a big proponent of that and something that Deion Dawkins struggled with early in his career when Castillo was with him. Uh, it's, it's where they're basically backpedaling. They're getting depth. And so the pocket is a lot more narrow for the quarterback, whereas opposed to Bobby Johnson, what he likes to do is he likes to be aggressive. He likes to meet those offensive linemen and defensive linemen out wide, close to the line of scrimmage as much as they can with those 45 degree sets and those aggressive jump sets. He is not that guy. So from a scheme standpoint and, and and from a blocking standpoint, I don't think he's much of a fit there. But from a zone running standpoint, that's his bread and butter. He's a zone run guy. Uh, he obviously played under uh, in that system and that zone run scheme there in Green Bay under Matt LaFleur. So he does fit from a, a zone run perspective, which the Bills were heavy zone run uh, team last year, zone run offense last year. So I think that is uh, obviously in his favor. And then we talked about it offline, Greg, and the drop off at offensive tackle in this in this free agent class it's it's quite the drop off especially if you're t- looking for guys that have some experience as a starter it's tyler moten and that's it <laughs> like you can make an argument Darrell williams is the second best tackle on the on the market which I, I literally after watching wagner i'm like oh my god maybe we should just go get williams and sign him like really well, though so lone wolf here is asking you know i do think it's more likely that we bring back Daryl Williams, then we bring back Matt Milano because sure. the way the market you know plays out. But if you had asked me last year, did I think George Fant was going to get forty million dollars over four years? I would have said no. That's crazy. He's not that good. So if you tell me that all of a sudden somebody like a desperate team, a, a Jacksonville or the Jets or some team with a whole bunch of money saw what Darrell Williams did and puts that together with with his all pro season and they give him three years and thirty six million is twelve million a year, the Bills aren't gonna pay that. They're they're just not. Right. You know, I think that if we you know, we joked at the beginning of the show about kind of that musical chairs, if other teams pay the other players that are out there, some of the teams that have a bunch of money, like the Colts, are pretty good on the offensive line. They're not going to be spending in that area. Um, The Patriots, I I think, are in decent shape and may not spend in that area. But if you all of a sudden have Darrell Williams come back and it's not perfect, maybe they can bring him back at two years and 16 million and closer to 8 million a year. Mm -hmm. I think he could come back to Buffalo. And then all of a sudden that frees up that first round pick that, Hey, maybe now you can play some different areas or look at other pieces, but it's, it's really going to come down to it. If, if his market gets out past Brandon Bean, Joe Shane, Dan Morgan are very disciplined in this is our value. We're going to offer you this contract. If you want it, that's great. If not, it's not there. Um, asking there, sadly, you know, the same way that Matt Milano's franchise tag gets ruined because technically Von Miller edge and rushers. Shaq, Shaq yeah. Barrett are outside linebackers, even though they're not, they're edge rushers. Um, tackle is tackle. There's no right tackle. There's no left tackle. Yeah. The franchise tag money, it's like $15 million and change. And it's terrible. Maybe they haven't done the full equations yet. Maybe it ends up fourteen million, but it is not viable. And I know a handful of people and other media contributors have talked about the idea of franchise tagging Matt Milano. It's insane to think that the Bills are going to try to create, 
either four, 13, 14 million for the linebacker or 14, 15 million for tackle and not be able to reach a long term deal. Like, if you're going to yeah. give somebody that much money, just come to an agreement. Both players want to be. You here. might as well just sign them. If you yeah. can create that much cap space, just sign them to a long term mm-hmm. extension. We want both players. So, thinking that we can create enough money to do that on a one year band aid. You would be talking about having to release three other players just to franchise tag him and then deal with this again next season. Yeah, and uh, another tackle that came to mind that I thought was a fit schematically and then had some good traits was a former first-round pick of the Bengals, right tackle Cedric Ogwehi, I believe is how you say it. Um, Yep, he played for the Seahawks last year. I I liked his film, man. Um, He's a guy that is you know pretty athletic, uh, quickly gets positional leverage, his hips in the gap, can seal off the alley for the running back. He's quick, he's explosive off the ball, especially in his kick slides. He's that kind of guy that can run those jump and aggressive sets and some yeah. of those angle sets. Uh, strong zone run blocker, obviously coming from C- the Seattle last year. They ran a lot of zone runs. And then with the Bengals, they were more of uh, um, a diverse run scheme, a complex run scheme uh, in Cincy. Uh, but he's a guy who's he's athletic enough to get that defensive lineman running, whether it's a D-tackle or DN, get him running horizontally on those zone runs and then giving those lanes for the running back. And he's he switches between vertical sets and angle sets. So he's uh, he's he's a guy that's well rounded. Uh, uh, of course, he's uh, a former first round pick. Those guys do get second chances more times than not. But I thought he did pretty well for uh, a quarterback that holds the ball a long time in Russell Wilson and scrambles all over the place. I thought his athleticism uh, held up pretty decently, especially towards the end of the year when they needed him to come in at right tackle. Well, and I love that idea of being able to you having another guy who can then let us get back into using Mitch Morris for his athleticism, getting yes. him out into space. I would love if we see a move like that where it then speaks to, OK, maybe we have a little something going there. I know you did some work on Jermaine Effetti as well. And mm-hmm. that those kind of guys, I, I think a boy, he is the kind of guy that would be an indicator to me that, OK, we're looking to add some athleticism. De- Deion Dawkins is a nasty, powerful, mean dude. Uh, and he's still a good athlete for the power kind of left tackle that he is. But this would give us an idea that, okay, they're, they're looking to get into that athleticism and, and using that. And I would love to be able to get more into that space. And you talk about, you know, maybe they have Ford and, and Dawkins on the left side being that power side. You know, maybe here you bring in a, a Creed Humphrey or Landon Dickerson and, and put him next to a guy like a boy and have some athleticism or movement there on the right side. That could be exciting. Yeah, I mean, just look at his explosiveness against the edge rusher here. And this, this guy's no joke at it, at defensive end there. That's, uh, I think that's, uh, Armstead. Yeah. So, I mean, look at his explosiveness on, in his angle set there. And then look at his first punch right there with his right hand. And it just, it's a really good play from him. And I know Russell does, you know, run out of the pocket here. But again, I think that you need to take that into account now with guys, uh, off at the offensive line. You know, you heard Bean say it. They need to get more athletic there. And, a lot of that has to do with Josh Allen and him holding the ball. He's still one of those guys, as as much as he's progressed as as a processor, he still holds the ball a very long time. Some of that is play action. You know, the Bills are top five, top seven in play action percentage. But a lot of that is just Josh Allen, like the way he doesn't like, you know, just going on to the next play. And that's why we love him a lot of times. And sometimes he just, you know, makes us pull our hair out of our head. But having an <laughs> athletic offensive lineman for Josh Allen is important. Having athletic linemen so that you can run a diverse run scheme may be even more important. I think he could help in that department. 100%. And you, know, you talked about the drop-off that's no different at guard. It's the same thing. When you're looking through, there's a lot of familiar names out there. That all of a sudden, you're quickly looking at, hey, maybe we do need to bring <laughs> Feliciano back. Or, hey, maybe we want John Miller back. Or, yeah. uh, you know, you look at Quentin Spain's name is out there. And it, it, you're talking about, well, maybe J.R. Sweezy has one more year left. It, it gets ugly quick. Like, there is not a lot of depth in the offensive line free agency market. And Daryl Williams is going to get paid. I have a feeling John Feliciano is going to get overpaid. Um, and, and it's going to be tough to be able to find some of the answers they need here. And uh, I encourage everyone to do a lot of work on the draft on offensive linemen. Yes, Cause that's, that's certainly studying. It's <laughs> certainly where I want them to go with seeing how much some of these guys who I think are more 
middle tier band aid kind of answers who are going to be paid like franchise answers to protect guys. And I, I'm not saying I don't want anyone. I do. We're going to sign some people because right now we have literally like four offensive linemen under contract. Yeah. Um, so we're going to add people. It's going to be some draft and some free agent. I hope the higher end investment are the premium picks rather than trying to spend to fix this because I don't know that there's a ton of answers right now. This is one area I could see teams who are really cap strapped maybe a couple answers hit the market that we're not expecting that could be a nice pleasant surprise uh but short of that you know you're probably talking about a a rick wagner and a draft pick kind of guy being the answer at some of these spots so we'll we'll see where it ends up going yeah and just real quick i I know you mentioned some of the guards i'm with you man like i looked at my depth chart last week for our show and then i looked at the the free agents market at at guard and i'm like okay maybe feliciano is not that bad if you can get him under a, a decent contract. You know, obviously not what they have him listed on uh, at guard, but uh, maybe Bakker wasn't as bad as we thought. And he's a restricted free agent. They should bring him back. We'll, no we'll have what. him back. Yeah, very cheap. Yeah. But it's Joe Tooney and Brandon Scherf, and then no one else. <laughs> yeah, and just, exactly. That's it. Like they're the, the and they're gonna, both going to get paid. 12, 13, 14, 15 million dollars, and then it's everybody else. And literally, someone will probably make the case that John Feliciano is the third best free agent guard. Mike Clay from ESPN did. Mike Clay had him ranked as the third best free agent guard after Scherf and yeah, I did see uh, that. You know, and Joe Tooney. And it's just that's the kind of market it is. Well, you know, same thing. Once you get past your, you know, Taylor Moten, Cam Robinson, Alejandro Villanueva. I think Daryl Williams is probably right there after that group. And, you know, those guys are all going to get easily 10 million plus. And if he gets caught up in that with uh, two teams go bidding for Tyler Moten and the team that loses could turn to Daryl Williams and be like, ah, screw it, give him 12 million. And he, then all of a sudden we're out of the running. Right. No, I, I'm, I'm with you, man. It's, it's, you know, offensive line in this, this off season is going to be tough. And, and that's why I am, all about, you know, bringing in a vet. Again, they have to at tackle. And I, I think right now where it stands, where this offensive line stands prior to free agency, I think that tight or offensive tackle early is where they need to invest. Right. And it's a premium position. So you got Dawkins locked up. I've, I've said it the last couple of weeks. You got Dawkins locked up. Go get a right tackle that maybe he doesn't start the first few games, but get one of those top off the tackles, a really good class. And there are guys that fit the scheme Get him, lock him in for you know, obviously five years in the first round. Uh, get him up, locked up for hopefully five years, and then you know you're good to go. You have Josh Allen's protection. You have those bookends, and then go from there. Fill in uh, free agency uh, at guard. You know, get some guys there, and also get someone in on the mid round. So um, let's switch. Let's change gears to kind of wrap this up. Tight end man, who are some names on the uh, free uh, free agent market that really uh, kind of catch your eye? So first, I'll rattle off a handful of the names that I don't think we're going to spend on. Uh, obviously, people know Hunter Henry, Gerald Everett, Jonu Smith. I think any of those would be awesome. They would be a huge piece to this offense. I, I think you made a good case as some of those names first came out. I don't know that the Bills are going to get into that 8 to $10 million range for a tight end. Um, it, I I will support it if they do. I think they could open up an option in this mm-hmm. uh, offense that isn't quite there. We're going to find out where they are on Dawson Knox. Are they in a position where Dawson Knox needs one more year to be the tight end one, but we want to add a guy to compete with him? Or do we need to invest in tight end because we're looking for that, that uh, high-end starter? One of the guys that I think – you compared to Dawson Knox from an athletic standpoint. Great compliment. You know, tall, athletic, yeah. moves really well. Is Dan Arnold from Arizona, 26 year old, was uh, University of Wisconsin Platteville kind of guy coming out in that area, was listed as a tight or a wide receiver coming out. Yeah. And, and they used him there, you know, uh, four six, 39 inch vertical, and actually got some action there in Arizona this last year, an offense that never used the tight end. He's the first one that's got some playing time here in almost five years. Yeah, and he's a he's a, a tall drink of water, much like I yeah. said uh, about Wagner. He's a uh, six six man, but yeah. he's he's kind of rail thin. He's two hundred twenty pounds, probably yeah. probably a little little more I, than that. But I even went and looked at the film because I saw him listed there. I'm like, he can't really still be two twenty. Yeah. Maybe he's two thirty or two thirty five. He Hopefully. ain't two fifty. He's not two fifty. Yeah. I can tell you no. that. 
No, and you can see some of his movement skills. He's the offline tight end right here. Watch this little pivot route. So he gets the corner. I think that's actually Witherspoon. He gets the corner to open up. You see him just pivot right out here, right to the first down. Like that, those type of skills, it's very basketball like. You see him drop his hips and then just pivot out wide there, uh, finds that soft uh, spot in the coverage. Like he moves pretty well. You saw in the first couple of clips, he can get down the field, but I, this, these type of routes right here where he pivots back to the middle field, this is what the Bills need. I think, Arnold, uh, Arnold's a good compliment to Knox in a lot of ways that, uh, you know, he's a guy that can stretch the field. He can get down the seam. He's six, six. So he's got that, uh, you know, that length and, and size and catch radius, but he can do things like this that we haven't quite seen from Dawson Knox, especially when we're talking, you see the three receiver sets here. You got a nub tight end and the running back here. This is a staple in the Bills offense. And a lot of times this guy's either running to the post, he's running deep. Or he's running some type of corner route right here. And, and, and usually this is an option route by the running back, out, in route, angle routes, those type of things. So having a guy that can run these type of pivot routes or return routes back to the middle of the field when these linebackers are worried about the running back in the flats, I mean, that type of uh, versatility and route running from a tight end, is, it would be nice to have. And I, I think what we saw with Knox at the end of the year where he was that short to intermediate guy and he was that guy that were, you know, throwing those under routes on play action passes or screens, you know, in the five yard range and then just working on his, you know, yardage after the catch ability. I I think this is where a guy like Arnold can help Dawson Knox and help clear things out down the seam. And then you could see Knox kind of work the underneath stuff in those 12 personnel sets. Yeah. And I think that, you know, obviously when you're talking about that rail thin and two, two twenty, two thirty, he's not some monstrous blocker. No. I think he's an effort blocker. I don't know that he's, you know, horrible and a, a, a huge detriment you could never use in 12 personnel or something like that. But and it's, it's mainly not... in line. It's mainly Correct. in line where his issues are. It's kind of like Dawson Knox, very similar yeah. in that respect. Dawson Knox was great out in space in 2019 and he was better in line in 2019. But this year in 2020, he really struggled with his consistency at blocking in line. Yeah, and I think Arnold, you're you're not adding him because he's Lee Smith. That's not what he's no, there for. No. You're adding him because he's a weapon and, and able to get out there and, and do some movement. He's also really young. You know, he's 25. He's not. He's going to turn 26 here soon. You're able to get him on the upswing where he's. You know, he was coming in as a college wide receiver who's now developing and trying to come in there. I also love the fact you're talking about one drop all of last year and zero the year before. Yeah. Um, so being in that kind of position where you know not a ton of targets. Um, but good, consistent hands. I, I think that would be an exciting alternative to add there and, and a kind of a piece that we don't have a 6 6 presence in that receiving core, um, you know, short of more development from Knox. I, I think he would be an exciting option of maybe slightly what they envisioned from Tyler Croft. And I think you can get him at a value deal. I think he's going to be a two or three million dollar guy. Again, you can tell everybody listening the kind of range that we're targeting here. Yeah. He is that lower middle class guy that in years past would have gotten maybe three or four million, maybe five million that I think you can maybe get him for a little bit below there. And a guy that if you're going to pitch him that, hey, you're going to take a one year deal from somebody to build up your uh, value and then try to go again in 2022, the Bills offense isn't a bad stab at that. Yeah. And, you know, some of these clips where, you know, that six, six frame and the length and catch radius and the ability to pluck the ball at the high point, uh, it, it really excites me from the red zone standpoint, because while the tight ends didn't produce all that often, they weren't targeted all that often last year. One area that they were tops near top of the league, I think their top five was touchdown percentage. And a lot of those touchdowns came in the red zone. So while they didn't have the premier tight end threat, uh, in you know, in their offense, and Dawson Knox and the Crofts of the world, and Lee Smith, um, you know, you you saw Dable scheme them up so well in the low red zone, and and seeing plays like this from Arnold, where he can you know be that guy in the red zone, just is really exciting. You see, even though he's big, look at his catch radius. Look at him go down and scoop this one up right off his shoelaces right there in traffic. So. I think he's a he's a good target for the Bills. He's a guy that can split the middle of the field like you see here, get down the middle of the field when those teams want to play those two high looks. He can get down the middle, be that target with his length for Josh Allen that they've been missing. I, I really liked him, man. Um, he's a guy that they can line up anywhere. As you saw in some of these clips, you can line him up outside. You can line him in the slot. Um, he can he can really do it all. I know his pass block or his run blocking is not all that good. But he's a guy that uh, I think he could, you know, when you want, if you guys are talking about running a lot of those 12 personnel sets, 
and not really wanting to spend the money to get a John U. Smith. You know, that's he's the kind of guy that could add that bang for your buck, that value player, and also be a scheme fit because he comes from a scheme in Arizona that obviously pass heavy, yeah. a lot of air raid type stuff, and you know, one that knows how to incorporate a tight end. I think that's where Daybolt needs to improve. Well, and with Lee Smith's retirement, with Tyler Croft being a free agent, with the uncertainty of whether Tommy Sweeney can ever play again, the Bills are going to add multiple tight ends. I think we're going to see more than one get added oh, yeah. here, uh, whether that's a mid to late round draft pick and a value guy here. You know, again, if they want to go, you know, I think both of us would like to see them find a way to restructure the contract for John Brown and to be able to keep him in the offense. Um, if they go another direction, that's the only path where I could see them go at that higher end tight end market is that they're looking to add that third passing target at a high end tight end. And they would just take the $8 million from John Brown and give mm-hmm. it to one of those higher end tight ends. I don't anticipate that, but that's the only path I could see them doing that. If not going with one of those guys, some of the other, you know, there's some veteran guys you've seen kicking around your Richard Rogers, your Trey yeah. Burton's um, Ricky seals. Jones is another younger guy who's athletic, who hasn't really had a chance Played for the to, Cardinals as well. Kind of play. similar, former wide receiver, bigger body type guy, not as big as Arnold, but very similar in that respect where yeah. he can run and drop those hips, um, former wide receiver as well. So yeah, he's another guy that, um, that is out there that, you know, also could be a guy like Arnold that, uh, can stretch the seam a little bit. Yeah. So Seals Jones and Arnold, and then a mid round pick, I think is the most likely path. And then yeah. next year we see a guy like Arnold Knox. Knox is still the tight end one in name. And then we'll see how things go as the season goes. Hopefully the fact that he was a converted quarterback and didn't in a very rudimentary college offense. And now going into his third season, we can go into that range uh, that he's ready to take a step forward. Then Arnold would be a nice tight end too. You still have Reggie Gilliam who's kind of your H back move guy mm-hmm. coming out of the backfield, taking the fullback snaps, playing special teams. And then maybe another developmental guy coming behind that from Knox in the draft. All of a sudden, and you have your tight end room back and you're able to rebuild that. I think that could be an interesting path. Yeah, it's definitely an area, guys, as you guys are talking in the chat, that they need to improve on. And it's not just personnel. You know, Brian Dable, as much as as good as he schemed in the red zone, he did not scheme all that well for the tight end group, you know, between the 20s. And a lot of that had to do with the weapons they have at wide receiver, which is why we haven't really talked about too many receivers. They have a really good wide receiver room right now as it stands, as Greg was just alluding to. Now, if there are some moves that are made, we'll come back and we'll do another show. And we'll, we'll look at some wide receivers, and, and, and especially when we talk about the draft. But as far as the wide receiver room, that's probably why we haven't really touched upon it because yeah. they're really good there. That's a strength. Heck, we're that's, adding Isaiah Hutchins. We, we didn't even have yeah, him last year. Exactly. So, And he's a guy that could be a quasi big slot, run those tight end type routes from the slot. I'm not saying he's a tight end, but that big slot, a lot of those that roll across the league – they're running routes just like tight ends would. So that is also something they could do with as much 11 P 11 personnel as the bills like the run. He's a guy they could just throw in a slot and he is a quasi type at tight end and, and run some of those routes that we saw from, you know, Arnold as well. So, uh, and he's kind of got that size, not as tall, but he's kind of got that size and he's a, actually a really good route runner. I'm excited to see where he stands in this wide receiver room. So, with that said, man, let's wrap it up. Let everyone know where they can find you, obviously, if they don't know, which if they don't know, they've sure. been under a rock for the last few years, but where they can find you and what do you guys have going on on Cover One Buffalo this week? Yeah, so uh, come and check us out. You can find me on Twitter at Greg Thompson and always uh, hanging out with Aaron and having a good time on the Cover One Buffalo podcast. Um, we're going to stick with doing weekly shows from now running all the way through the off season. We're going to try to go in the phases of the season that we see here. So the last two weeks we've done, you know, kind of season and review, give out awards kind of going over the offense and the defense special teams and coaching check those shows out if you haven't had a chance yet now we're really going to switch gears kind of tonight was the kickoff for that as we go forward being able to look at our next steps here we're going to do a little bit uh in-house kind of looking at you know let's make sure we're really clean on who's back who's not where some of those holes are options to create some cap space where we can take a look at it what the needs are and then we'll start leading into free agency we've got about three more weeks here before things really start to heat up you're going to see a lot more discussions of you know who's been restructured who's kicked money around who's been released not just from the bills but all over the place Uh, and we're going to lead you guys right up to there to march 17th in the kickoff of the new league year 
No, it's uh, I love you know tuning into your guys' show, and um, it's the type of content, especially this time in the year, that's evergreen because you guys are so in depth and detailed when it comes to salary cap contracts, who's on the market. Like you literally cover every angle that is covered. That's why we brought you on to cover one. You and Aaron always you know cover every single thing. Every angle, and we appreciate you guys' work week in and week out. Uh, this week for the film room, uh, we are going to be doing uh, a sit down with Jarrett Patterson, That's the awesome. running back from UB, the UB Bulls, uh, a guy that I've been waiting to sit down and break down some film with uh, since he was a freshman. He obviously took the NCAA by storm uh, the last couple of years, a very productive, talented back, especially considering. You know, everything that's been thrown at him when you talk about his recruiting pro- process uh, to get to UB with his brother. And what we're going to be focusing on is outside zone. And it kind of ties into what the Bills are looking at uh, this year, because as I said, when when uh, Anthony and I broke down the running game, they became very zone heavy. They, they ran a lot of outside zone and he comes from a program that runs a lot of outside zone. And they're one of the best teams at doing it. Very talented, very consistent. And I feel like a lot of people don't understand, uh, you know, what it takes to be a running back in that type of scheme. A lot of times they think of, you know, the Arian Fosters, the Terrell Davises that are just hitting wide open holes because the offensive line did a lot of the lifting. Well, a lot of, you know, a lot of what happens for a running back in those scenarios on those outside zone runs happens from the shoulders up, happens in his brain and processing blocks and leverage. And I want to break that down and being a former running back, as some of you guys know, it's going to be fun. And so I hope you guys tune in Wednesday night, awesome. 7 p.m. Normally we do Tuesday, but we're going to go to Wednesday to help him out with his schedule. He's been training on his speed down in Florida at Bamaritos. Obviously a really big camp when it comes to speed and working on speed. It's one of the, the knocks on him by a lot of draft analysts. So we're excited to break down the film with him on Wednesday. And, uh, you know, I hope you guys tune in. I hope you guys enjoy this, uh, you know, film session again. Go back and, and watch it again. Watch some of this film and uh, obviously, uh, tune in to all of our content every day. We have a show for you every day, and, and we appreciate you tuning in. Yeah, I appreciate you guys. That show is going to be killer with Jared Patterson. I can't wait to see you break down the film with him. And uh, had a great time. Thought you guys were awesome in the chat. Really appreciate everything. Uh, to check out everything we have going on. Come and join us. Give us a rating. Give us a review. Give us a like. I know we hate asking for those things. It really does make a big difference letting people know where we're at. It really means a lot. We appreciate it. But for Eric Turner and Greg Thompson, you've been listening to Cover One. We are out.